During the height of Wednesday's blackout, fire crews had to free people trapped in elevators. The idea of playing elevator roulette may sound funny, but try living with it. Come on, come on. Come on. My baby. Put yourself in the middle of California during the summer of 2000, when blackouts began to roll across the state. Sacramento, San Francisco, Beverly Hills, Long Beach, San Diego. The energy crisis would cost California $40 billion. For the second day in a row, not enough electricity for America's largest state and the world's sixth largest economy. I, I, I can feel for him. I was out of power four times this weekend for a total of over 10 hours. There simply wasn't enough electricity available. As the blackouts continued, there were competing narratives presented by the media. One such narrative was, this is just an unusual heat wave. Generating capacity is going to catch up. Today we know there was much more to it than that. The first thing we heard about this energy crisis is where our lights are going to go off in the middle of winter when we're using half the electricity we normally use during the summer. We have an installed capacity in California at the time of 45,000 megawatts, plenty of power. We only need 28,000 to 30,000 megawatts in December. Of course, we had blackouts in December. The numbers just didn't add up. We had enough power in California. It was never about lack of supply. You know, talking about OPEC puts me in mind of a simpler time when the energy interests we were held hostage to were American ones. And given the complexity and dryness of the subject, it seemed impossible the charges could ever be proven, unless somehow somebody turned up some sort of smoking gun. Which brings us to last week. Hey, John. It's Tim. The regulatory is all in a big concern about is we're wheeling power out of California. Two Enron traders discuss a colleagal manipulation of the California power market. He just f***s California. He steals money from California to the tune of about a million. Can we rephrase that? Okay, he, um, he, he arbitrages the California market to the tune of a million bucks or two a day. <laughs> um, Those greedy mother arbitragers. <laughs> Enron traders started to export power out of the state. I'll see you guys. I'm taking mine to the desert. When prices soared, they brought it back in. So we fucking export like a motherfucker. You're getting rich. Trying to. What are the permutations and combinations of ways to move power around the West? Traders would stay after a 12-hour shift and pour over maps of the Western energy grid. And I think that that's something that Enron knew better than any other energy marketer in the country, period. We know all of the California load. We know all of the California imports. By shutting down power plants, they could create artificial shortages that would push prices even higher. Hey, uh, this is David up at Enron. Uh-huh. There's not much uh, demand for power at all. And we're, if we shut it down, could you bring it back up in three or four hours? Okay. When you see 30, 35% of their entire capacity down for maintenance on a single day, the price of electricity skyrocketing three or 400%, you begin to believe something's not smelling right here. They're getting pretty spoiled, don't we? It's money. You're getting a little scared or making a little too much, and I, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> At the flip of a switch, could just yank the California economy on its leash whenever they wanted to, and they did it, and they did it, and they did it, and they made so much money. I want you guys to get a little creative okay. and come up with a reason to go down. Like a forced outage type thing. Right. An industry that went for 100 years from the days of Edison was very reliable, was all of a sudden turned into a casino. Can't treat electricity like you treat oranges. It's the lifeblood of society. There would be ample supply available at the right fucking price. They're taking all the money back from you guys? All the money you guys stole from those poor grandmothers of California? <laughs> yeah, Grandma Millie, man. Yeah, now she wants her money back for the power you've charged right up, jammed right up her for $250 a megawatt hour. California's man-made blackouts began in June of 2000, before intermittent energy sources, such as wind power, had any meaningful presence. Back then, almost all energy produced was of a reliable nature. There were no questions about clouds in the sky 
or how windy it was across the state. There is only a glaring discrepancy between generating capacity and lack of power. Even so, it took actual audio recordings of Enron traders joking about poor Grandma Millie before everyone could finally agree on what had happened, that no greater good had been served by skyrocketing energy prices and rolling blackouts. They weren't a necessary teething pain of deregulation or the kick in the pants needed to get more generating capacity built. Enron traders had deliberately constrained California's access to electricity and they got rich doing it. It took four years to achieve clarity on those blackouts. We might not be so lucky next time. Intermittent energy sources do not lend themselves to clarity. When the media talk about peak production capacity and don't mention capacity factor, that's not clarity. On the best day, they're doing pretty well midday, right? But on the worst day, in January, you got nothing. But this is what everybody forgets. As if the planet stops rotating, the clouds part, and Germany is baking in the sun, you know, because the sun shines on Germany 24 hours a day. Tom Friedman the other day, New York Times, brought up Germany as an example, saying that Germany is 30% wind and solar. Most self-described environmentalists believe that that chunk is entirely wind and solar. Wind and solar. When the media brands Germany's renewable program as one of solar and wind emitting biomass, that's not clarity. This is not the fault of solar and wind technology. They are very useful so long as we recognize and plan for their limitations. To fully harness intermittent power, we need both a smart grid and inexpensive energy storage. Today, we have neither, and I think it's very risky to presume we will get both. As we deploy renewables, increasingly, wind ends up losing to wind and solar ends up losing to solar. They deliver energy, or fail to, at the same time. The greater the solar and wind penetration, the steeper the peaks and troughs in supply. Here is a picture of a simulation of supply meeting demand. The year is 2010, so that is actual demand across the top line for 2010. The supply underneath has been modelled from renewable energy sources by Elliston Diesendorf McGill in order to demonstrate that it could be met using renewable sources only. With wind, this mountain type profile here is the coming and going of wind generation over this seven day period. The dark blue here represents solar PV. The yellow here is concentrating solar thermal with storage. Blue is the hydro, which leaves this fellow here. And that's biomass. Moving windmills apart helps. Energy storage helps. More transmission lines help. In the real world, we certainly do all these things. Wired Magazine, they're like, to get a new trunk line to San Francisco, they like went the opposite way. And they're like, is that far enough away for people? You know, it's longer and more transmission loss. The insanity of the NIMBY thing. We are not running a high power line through my neighborhood. I'll get electromagnetic radiation. Germany is a nation building transmission lines and storing energy and deploying renewables from one end of the country to the other. Despite all this, they burn more and more biomass every year and will miss their 2020 carbon emission target. If we're going to dismantle everything and replace it with something different, let's first make sure that different thing is better. Between 2010 and 2014, Germany switched 7% of their energy supply from nuclear power to renewables, with coal constantly supplying 43% of Germany's energy needs. Demnach kostet die Energiewende die deutschen Verbraucher pro Jahr insgesamt 28 Milliarden Euro. Because Germany has been paying 28 billion Euro every year to subsidize renewable energy, they were able to shut down half of their nuclear power plants without burning more coal. But Germany still had to burn stuff to replace nuclear. In fact, the single largest energy source in the German renewable portfolio is biomass. This biomass is called a renewable resource because it's not a fossil fuel and ultimately comes from plants which can be regrown. However, it is not an environmentally friendly source of power and it causes air pollution. In 2015, we exported over 5 million tons of wood pellets. That's in about five years. 
So talk about an explosion. They're clear-cutting our wetland forests. We at Dogwood have worked to prove that. They're shipping it over to Europe, and they're burning it in power stations. The same forests that we work so hard to protect, the same forests that provide all those benefits. Repeatedly in developed nations, a similar pattern unfolds. In 2011, California shut down San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station. Those opposed to nuclear power painted a picture of solar and wind replacing it. What ended up filling the gap was the combustion of natural gas. In 2014, the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Station was shut down. It was the fifth largest source of electricity for New England. It sure looks like the people trying to shut it down thought it would be replaced by renewables. Instead, it was replaced by burning oil and coal. Nuclear plants close, resulting in more combustion and more pollution. The only beneficiaries were those providing the alternate source of power. In the case of San Onofre, alternate sources of power were provided to California by its parent corporation, Edison International. In the case of Entergy's Vermont Yankee, alternate power was provided to New England by a natural gas power plant owned by Entergy Wholesale Commodities. While a nuclear plant is in operation, the utility pays into a decommissioning fund. This money cannot be touched until the plant is ready for retirement, or when it is taken into early retirement. The owner of the shuttered Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant have hundreds of millions of dollars stashed away for the decommissioning process. Today, federal regulators announced it can also use that money to deal with spent nuclear fuel. Closing Vermont Yankee released $665 million in decommissioning funds to the utility. Closing San Onofre will release over $4 billion. Pilgrim is next. A 690-megawatt reactor, it produces 14% of the electricity generated in Massachusetts. It has a summer capacity factor of 98%, making it a very reliable source of summertime electricity. There's no technical reason to shut down this source of pollution-free energy. However, the decommissioning fund contains $870 million. With me today, I have Jitter Shah, who is the president of Generate Capital. He was the founder of Sun Edison. I'm not here to suggest that solar power should be powering the world, but I think both nuclear and solar and all these other zero-carbon fuels can be scaled up to meet the challenge. I have figured out how to get this right in solar and how to actually win the war. The nuclear guys haven't. They're just saying, if we just put the facts out, people will finally believe us. This is a political battle. And I'm happy to bring my lessons learned from the solar industry to the nuclear industry. But I think that this notion that we have a functioning nuclear power industry that has the ability to play the game is fanciful. There is a fairly straightforward way to save all those plants. But the nuclear industry has to actually pursue it. And the guys who own Pilgrim aren't even trying to save it. It's everyone who doesn't own Pilgrim in the nuclear industry who's saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to save Pilgrim? Most of the people that you hear are not the nuclear industry. They're people who are in favor of nuclear technologies. And I know that I don't garner many friends within the industry when I say this, but Entergy is perfectly happy to shut down Pilgrim, and so are Entergy's friends because they all perceive that right now there's an oversupply of electricity. They'll shut down their nuclear plants, and people say, well, how can they do that? And then, of course, the answer is that all of them have decommissioning funds already put aside, so they'll come out looking fine on their balance sheet, and they'll drive the price of electricity up for all the rest of their generating plants. Given all the wind turbines being deployed, it is not intuitive that shutting down nuclear leads to more pollution and higher energy prices. California's energy crisis was a confusing mess, too, when you're stuck in the middle of it.